Hello, this is the second introductory lesson uh, to newspapers. Um, it is about knowledge and uh, skills regarding the analysis of newspapers um, before we get on with the set products um, or set text if you like. Um, this one is really about image analysis and so it is a recap of some of the stuff we did right at the beginning of the year and uh, a building up to combining both this session and the previous one to be able to do a semiotic analysis of a newspaper front page. That's reflected in our learning objectives, which are to revisit the composition techniques used in the analysis of photography in particular, and of course to deconstruct newspaper front pages via a thorough semiotic analysis. And our initial thought starting activity idea, if you like, is uh, an old saying I'm sure you've heard of, a picture tells a thousand words. What do you understand by this and what do you agree with it? And some ideas to consider here, first of all, is obviously what does a photograph do that words actually can't? In what ways can a photo maybe create a feeling that is more evocative um, and powerful than perhaps uh, simply words written down? Of course, images are very powerful. They're uh, engaged with us on a sensory uh, level, I suppose. They rely on our sight. Um, they can be uh, something that is incredibly aesthetic, sometimes aesthetically pleasing, sometimes in a way that sort of challenges us or jars with our, our idea of aesthetics. Uh, they can remind us of... Uh, our own experiences perhaps and things that we have seen or perhaps we can get an understanding of what's going on much easier because it puts us in a position the use of color the use of shade and light is really powerful in our understanding of images um, they can be maybe perhaps more immersive um, um, than uh, words in the way that they position um, us close or far away from subjects um, and ideas. Image, no doubting that images can be incredibly powerful. But we should also consider the opposing idea. Are there instances where language can actually be more evocative than a photograph? Uh, can the use of language through metaphor, simile, um, through rhetorical devices, exaggeration, can, are there times where actually words can make us more immersed and uh, inside of a, an idea or a story and then finally i suppose if we're going to consider opposing arguments we should perhaps consider a third way this idea of whether words and images have a symbiotic relationship and this word symbiotic means a relationship that relies on one another where actually words and pictures combine to create a more immersive um idea or immersive um uh, reaction and response for an audience member. I was finding it interesting that obviously picture books for children have pictures because reading is a skill and language needs to be acquired before kids can understand what's going on in a story. But it doesn't just end with uh, picture books and books with words. Often there's this middle ground where um, when children are learning to read, they'll have pictures to accompany them. And so maybe there's something in that, that actually a combination of words and images can be a more evocative and more immersive experience for audiences. There's no surprise we're considering this looking at newspapers as well, the idea that words and images might go together. Before we move along, just want to quickly reference the four images that uh, I've selected for this slide. Uh, they come from... Um, not necessarily a website, but an idea that was sort of I've been aware of for the past few years uh, called Accidental Renaissance. And this is where photographs, usually journalistic photographs, um, but sometimes sort of more sometimes citizen photojournalism, if you like, um, a photograph can capture the spirit and the essence and the feel of a, a Renaissance painting. Um, so if any of you are interested in photography or fine art might appreciate this uh, Renaissance um Paintings and illustrations often captured uh, religious uh, iconography or moments, or, but sometimes societal ones, often acts of violence or conflict and uh, and so on. And uh, these images are no different, whether they're from uh, images of politics or sport or sometimes things happening on the streets of our uh, of our nation uh, these images are from that collection so if you're interested have a search for those accidental renaissance some of them are absolutely brilliant 
Well, let's continue with this theme of a picture tells a thousand words and do some image analysis. Uh, this is actually a very famous picture, although it's one that hadn't, I'll be completely honest, crossed my radar until the past maybe sort of 10 years or so. It's, a, it's an image called Migrant Mother, taken by the photographer Dorothea Lang in 1936. But before we get into the actually what it's about and what it's all to do with, I want uh, I want you to take a moment really to think about your own response to the image itself um, and the way we do that is to analyse and we analyse by looking at connotations and denotations what's there and what's implied by those things what narratives can you see in the photo uh, clearly this image can tell us so much but what story do you have what is the story you've come up with for this particular photograph and of course Whilst we might have an immediate gut reaction to this photo, an instinct about what it's about, uh, it might immediately bring stories to our own mind. We analyse by looking at the composition of a photograph. So going back to the rules of photography that we looked at right at the start of the course, we've got things like the rule of thirds, lines and shapes, light and shade, foreground and background, and framing. Now, there is a story behind this, obviously, but uh, before we sort of divulge that and have a look at it, really what it's actually about, um, have a think about the connotations and denotations. And often the most common theme when I've spoken to students about this photograph, um, students who've never seen it before, is the connotations of extreme poverty. That's often looked at by the, uh, obviously, the, the things to do with the mise-en-scene, uh, the sort of shabbiness of the clothing, the sort of torn grey um, plain clothing in this photograph but uh, but also of course the facial expressions of the mother who looks stressed and worried there's a great deal of anxiety and concern and that's emphasized by a few things in terms of the uh, composition of the photograph the first one most strikingly is obviously the rule of thirds being used to frame the mother in the central third central column of this if we look at it vertically um, she's flanked by two children who very very obviously look away from the camera who'd have their heads turned so we never get a sense of their identity only that they are using their mother to shield them or protect them while she is there having to be their guardian to look a to look and face the music as it were but she's not making eye contact with the camera uh, she's lost in her own world her furrowed brow looks away from the camera and obviously emphasizes the concern that she has and the anxiety she feels other connotations of that anxiety are the her hands touching her mouth and her face which often uh, is a signifier of of uh, stress the furrowed lines on her, her forehead again reinforce those ideas. And something that is often missed by students when they first look at this photograph, but again emphasised by the rule of thirds if you carefully look at it, is that she actually has a baby in arms. There is a fourth figure in this image, a baby again shabbily dressed with dirty face, uh, again connotations of poverty. The actual story behind this, uh, and students often consider different ideas, is it war? Is it to do with the role of maybe women and mothers at an earlier period in time? Well, it's actually from, uh, some of you may have worked this out from the, 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 the age of the photograph. 1936 was right in the middle of the Depression era in the United States, uh, which came after the Wall Street crash in 1929. And for those of you who are um, remember Year 9 English, or maybe later when you read Of Mice and Men, I'm sure most of you have done that by John Steinbeck, will be aware that this was an era of great recession and depression and financial problems for much of America, who had to rely on itinerant work moving from place to place and that's when this photo was taken a couple of questions that are worth considering though is do you think that the photo was taken spontaneously or do you think it was a staged photo set up by the photographer does it change the meaning of the photo depending on what the answer to that uh, uh, previous question is do you does it make it less believable if it were staged compared to if it was just a snapshot taken these are all things that need to be considered uh, when looking at a photo and, and also our response as an audience to photos. But I can give you a little bit more detail uh, in a quotation from the artist or the photographer themselves, Dorothea Lang. I saw and approached the hungry and desperate mother as if drawn by a magnet. I do not remember how I explained my presence or my camera to her, but I do remember that she asked me no questions. 
I did not ask her a name or her history. She told me her age, that she was 32. She said that she had been living on frozen vegetables from the surrounding fields and birds that the children killed. She had just sold the tyres from her car to buy food. There she sat in that lean-to tent with her children huddled around her and seemed to know that my pictures might help her and so she helped me. There was a sort of equality about it. So in answer to those previous questions, it's kind of a bit of both. Uh, the picture wasn't staged per se. She wasn't asking the figure to move around or to stand in a certain way. As far as we know, she didn't ask the children to stand by her mother. But neither did she make her presence sort of unknown. Uh, the woman was aware that there was a photographer in front of her. She knew that she was being captured that moment. Um, but she didn't react or respond to this. I think it's a really interesting idea that the sort of idea that not only do you capture meaning as a photographer, uh, but that, that meaning is created by the subject as well. And this is why we talk about representation being constructed not only by the encoder of the media, or the subject of the uh, image or media, but also we bring our own meaning to things, so the audience is complicit or part of that construction. But a powerful photo, I'm sure you'll agree. Okay, so let's move on to some more photographic analysis that we can relate to the idea of um, photojournalism and newspaper photography. What I you to think about as you look at these first two pictures um this first one uh, above obviously of the uh, racing driver lewis hamilton um a formula one driver um uh, taken a few years ago now as you can probably tell he's a little bit younger than he is right now but um what i'd like you to do is to predict what the article that accompanies these photos might be about what narratives do you see what stories can you tell can you provide a caption for each of the photos and what we're actually talking about here is the that importance, that symbiotic relationship that words and images have, particularly in newspapers. Um, and in print journalism, um, whether that's magazines or newspapers, we have this idea of anchorage. Make sure you write a definition down here um, in your notes. Uh, anchorage is copy, um, what we refer to as copy is writing or text that gives meaning to an image. Think of anchorage as a metaphor. If you think about it, the words will actually anchor or fix meaning to the image, um, just in the same way that an anchor fixes a boat to one place. Now, I'm sure there are a variety of different stories that you've come up with uh, for these images. Um, let's have a look at the actual stories to see if it's very different to what you came up with. The first one here of Lewis Hamilton, race hate thugs attack F1 ace Lewis Hamilton. And the second one, Bittersweet homecoming for Helmand Paris. So have a think, how has the anchorage now changed the meaning of the image? How are you now looking at the images in a different way? And are some things perhaps more prominent than before? Well, it's interesting because perhaps let's start with the first one. Certain ideas become a lot more prominent now that we know this is actually a story about uh, race and um, discrimination and prejudice. Um, rather than perhaps Hamilton's job as a racing driver, um, suddenly his uh, eye contact or his facial expressions become one of being distant rather than perhaps one being focused. Uh, one of perhaps there being bigger problems in the world than just his job rather than one of determination. Uh, I also think that the use of Colour in the photography here becomes more prominent because it makes us aware of Lewis Hamilton's skin colour a lot more. So there are different composition techniques that become much more prominent in this image. The fact that it's cropped makes him seem a lot more trapped than perhaps he was before. If we look at the bottom image, the bittersweet homecoming for Helmand Paris, uh, many students suggest that this is perhaps a going away image, that, this, uh, that the photograph is of Paris leaving whereas it's uh, somewhat of a twist to see it's actually a homecoming. Um, that word bittersweet, the idea of something joyful but also difficult, uh, is reinforced now, particularly by the facial expression of the soldier in the centre of the image. Um, his facial expression is looking at what we can assume is his son, obviously considering the good things about being home but there is a sort of sadness to the soldier maybe thinking about all the things that went um, when he was away 
Uh, other things like the kind of grey monotone of the buses in the background suggest a kind of sadness and a downbeat idea to this. Uh, but we also notice the Union flag folded up in the arms of the soldier that appears in the background. So things like background and foreground perhaps become more prominent. So our image analysis is really important, as is anchorage. And it's a skill that we have and that we develop throughout media studies and that we should develop and, and remind ourselves of, of as we go back into studying newspapers. But if we put all the pieces back together again, what we end up with is the ability to deconstruct fully a newspaper front page. And that means these two introductory sessions have covered a number of different aspects. First of all, the key differences between tabloid and, news and broadsheet newspapers. Second of all, the uh, analysis of headlines and also language in newspapers. We've looked at how the masthead and layout and uh, design of a newspaper can be analysed. We've considered the application and understanding of news values. We've looked at how newspapers will set the agenda through their own ideologies. We can analyse the photographs uh, that are included in newspaper front pages and also the importance of anchorage to construct meaning. So let's look at this particular front page of The Guardian in more detail um, and provide a text semiotic analysis so that you feel confident in being able to do your own. Uh, we can see, as with most uh, front pages of newspapers there are a number of stories here particularly broadsheet newspapers focus on not just one main story but several at the top above the masthead we have features um, and uh, and if you like uh, teasering us into the newspapers the main headline here is labor won't win t says top union backer party will be doing well to win 200 seats at the election mccloskey claims um, but also the image next to it is not relating to that story as a separate story. I wanted to have my say. I just came out with it. A direct quotation from um, a woman called Cathy Moen who confronted Prime Minister Theresa May. Uh, this was a newspaper from May 2017 on the lead up to a general election that Theresa May had called shortly after becoming leader of the Conservative Party. So just take a moment now to pause this video and read the article um, or the articles, I should say. The one first one about uh, the claims made by the trade union leader, Len McCluskey. The second one about the confrontation that this normal member of the public had with the then Prime Minister Theresa May. And then thirdly, below the fold, this final article um, that has the headline, healthy, obese people still at high risk, say scientists. So let's do a semiotic analysis of this and have a look at how you can deconstruct uh, the different aspects of the paper, starting with the uh, masthead. So the word guardian has connotations of safety, custodianship, protection. Perhaps this links to the ownership by the Scott Trust Limited, formed to safeguard the journalistic freedom and liberal values of the guardian free from commercial or political interference. The suggestion is that this newspaper is the keeper of good, honest journalism. It's not controlled by its owners or advertisers or political parties, and it's free to say what it wants. The masthead is written all in lowercase and uses a curved front, unlike most other newspapers which use block capitalised text. And this uniqueness is arguably a more personal mode of address, which offers perhaps an alternative form of journalism to the rest of the industry. Moving on to consider the language used. As, express, as expected, the language for a broadsheet is formal and at times suggests that there's a certain level of education or at least good vocabulary is needed to understand the articles fully. For example, in the Rowena Mason article the, the, on the public grilling of Theresa May, it uses phrases such as introduced external assessment of the disability claimants rather than self-assessment and introduced more stringent eligibility criteria. So that formal language is uh, is introduced and expected that the audience will understand. The paper also uses various devices expected of the medium, such as the use of statistics and quotations directly prominent from people in the articles. 
In keeping with the style of the newspaper and the ideologies implied by the masthead, the headlines are not sensationalist or extreme. They're simple and they give the impression of just providing the facts, suggesting that the reader is able to make their own minds up. Let's have a look at the layout and style and the imagery used here. The page is certainly busy without being cluttered. It has an organised and formal feel to it. The image is almost central to the page and the audience's eye will be drawn to it. The image feels natural and, un um, and understated, connoting that the paper has an honest approach to representation, whilst also championing normal and regular people um, as it opposed to as it uh, as opposed to something like an image of an unreliable celebrity an unreliable celebrity or out of touch politicians the main headline uh, is not related to the main image which suggests that no one story is more important than another encouraging the audience to make their own minds up and also you may have noticed there is the start of a few articles which asks the reader to continue inside overall we would say perhaps there is a sort of calm and formal tone. Nothing feels over the top or in your phone face, which suggests that the reader is not going to be bombarded with unnecessary information or exaggeration. Let's move on to look at news values. There are clearly a variety of different news values being used to select stories from the pump page, and these make sure that there is a numerous appeals for the potential reader uh, without the sensationalism that might be used in a red top or mid-market tabloid. And that's a, a key difference between tabloids and uh, broadsheet newspapers. But most obvious of these news values are recency and continuity. Two of them, three main stories refer to events that have just happened, but are actually bigger part of a bigger story that the audience will have been following, mainly the run-up to the general election. As for the Katie Moen story in particular, there is also meaningfulness and personality. And it's not just a political, but a human interest story um, with the member of the public being the key figure uh, as she challenges the Prime Minister Theresa May. The story about obesity at the bottom here is not necessarily one that um, is uh, very recent, uh, but does use negativity. Um, uh, but also elite persons in the form of scientists. The story also has currency because the subject matter is one that is often discussed in the media. And then finally, agenda setting. Now, the agenda being set here is in keeping with most broadsheet newspapers that politics is more important than celebrity gossip or sporting news, which is things championed often by tabloid newspapers as well as the ideology that long-form journalism detail is also an important part of reporting the news, again, opposed to the kind of short-form, more um, uh, gossipy style of tabloid newspapers. In terms of The Guardian's own ideologies and agenda, again, this front page includes everything expected from a left-wing Labour-supporting newspaper. Whilst the headline might suggest a negative representation of the then-Labour leader, leader, Jeremy Corbyn, it's actually in fact largely positive and most importantly the paper uses the opportunity to report on some of Corbyn's more socialist policies which at the time other newspapers focused more on his personality or his persona. Perhaps it's interesting that the headline is there to create an illusion that the newspaper is more neutral. Um, however the second article attacking the Conservative Prime Minister makes it clear that The Guardian opposes government policies, as do a number of the other articles featured here. So, we have our semiotic analysis completed just through looking at those elements. For your own criteria, when writing any semiotic analysis, you should consider the following. The masthead, the headlines... The main image, including anchorage, of course, the layout and design of the paper, the use of language throughout, not just the headlines, but the main articles as well. The values of the newspaper in terms of why has those stories been selected. Uh, look at the list from the first session we, we had a look at. And then, of course, the agenda setting. What are the newspaper's ideologies? What evidence can you find of those ideologies from that front page? If you combine all of those things together, it's quite easy to construct a very simple semiotic analysis of a newspaper front page.